Okay, everybody, we have reached the bottom of the hour, so let's get started with today's L10 webinar. Are you getting the results you need from your trading strategy? Sponsored by CMR Institute. My name is Tim Sosby. I'm Editorial Director for L10. It's my pleasure to serve as your host of today's webinar. I'm going to, in the interest of time, skip ahead of our uh, normal housekeeping items that hopefully many of you have seen anyway. Just to tell you quickly, if you have any questions today or uh, at one point you'll be prompted by the speaker to provide some input, you can use the questions window on that control panel there on the right side of your screen. So again, any questions you have throughout today's program, please do ask them while they occur. And you'll also be able to use that questions window to when prompted by the speakers to provide some input for our program today. So again, I'm going to move things quite ahead, uh, right ahead here. I'm going to turn things over to our first speaker today, Carrie Garrett from CMR. She's gonna tell us more about the speakers and get the program started. Carrie, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Welcome everyone to CMR and l second When Something's Missing You Notice micro webinar session. Today we're talking about results, R-E-S-U-L-T-S. -E Today that stands for Really Effective Solutions to Upgrade Your Learning and Training Strategy. Mm -hmm. We also want to discuss the role of measurement and how you can get the most out of your training strategy. Before we get started, I want to introduce myself. I'm Carrie Garrett, Director of Learning Strategy at CMR Institute. CMR Institute is, by definition, considered an off-the-shelf provider because we do offer clients turnkey blended learning solutions that can be put into place in a matter of hours. We also offer so much more than that and consider ourselves a partner to our clients in helping them achieve their goals and fill in their gaps. In our last mini-webinar session, our question was, what is your gap? Do you not have enough time to get everything done? you don't have the right skill sets on your team, or maybe you're limited by your budget. But gaps just aren't in time, talent, or budget. In this session, we want to take a look at when something's missed with our results. That is, what are the expected versus the actual outcomes of your learning strategies and initiatives? What is the missing piece that will give you a full picture of the training results you hope to achieve? This is the topic we hope to tackle today. Now, by the way, if you missed our first 30 mini webinar session on overcoming time, budget, and talent constraints, you can find it on the CMR Institute website. But we're also posting a link in the handouts window if you'd like to check it out. And that handout is called the CMR Results Webinar Handouts, and it has that and some other useful information uh, that we think that you'll like. Now, before we go any further, I want to talk about some folks who are used to getting results, and that's our speakers for this session. Today we'll be talking with Jason Zeman, Senior Director of Leadership and Organizational Development at Bosch Health, Jeff Taylor, Senior Director of Sales Training from Ibsen, and Brittany Conrad, Client Solutions Project Manager from CMR Institute will also be joining us. So first we want to start with a little bit of an audience poll. Um, what do you think is your training's rate of learning transfer. So what percentage of training do you think actually transfers over to real life? So Tim started the poll for us. So we want you all to take a guess. Do you think it's 17%, 37%, or 57%? So you can just um, submit your vote now. Okay, so we're still collecting responses. All right, so put in any last minute guesses there. All right, Tim, so looks like most everybody has voted. Can you, um, oh, some more people are coming in. Um, Tim, can you close that for us and let's check it out, see what people think the answer I, is? I sure will, everybody, thanks for sharing with us. And Carrie, here are the results. Okay, so wow, it's a tie between 17 and 37%. And actually, it's, the answer is actually 37%. So let's think about that for a minute. That means that only 37% of the people you train actually go on to apply what they've learned once the training event is complete. But I guess this is good news for those of you who thought 17%. Um, inversely and more staggering, that means that 63% of your learners aren't pulling through the necessary knowledge or skills. If application knowledge transfer and performance improvement is the point of what we do, then we're falling way short. Another way to ask this question is, what is the cost of not pulling through learning? considering how much we spend on training overall and that 63% of that money is wasted. And this is really staggering. And something I learned this week through a conversation with uh, Jason Zeman, who's joining us today, is that it takes 66 days to turn something into a habit. 
Um, and I just assumed it was, I'd heard 21 days, and he was telling me today it's 66 days. It's not that 21 days that we've probably all heard before. So what are we doing in those days and months after a learning event to help our learners and move the needle on our rate of transfer? As a training leader, that task can be really daunting because we focus so much time on making training events, like a workshop or an e-learning course, the very best they can be, that we leave little time to focus on the smaller tasks or pieces of supportive learning. But today we're here to give you seven simple tools that you can use before, during, or after a learning event to help boost learning and change those behaviors. I want to show you some examples of some application pieces that can move you from desired pull-through results to actual pull-through results. And the first question guide. Last week at DevLearn, Art Cohen, famed neuroscientist, explained that the gold standard of learning application and follow through is to have managers go to learners after a training event and ask them some simple questions. Like, what did you learn and what are you going to do with that knowledge? Coaching guides are a great way to reach that gold standard and they can be very simple. Coaching guides serve two purposes. First is that it helps ensure that your learners have learned what you wanted them to learn and that they understand how that, learner, how that learning transfers over to the real world. Coaching guides are beneficial to use during cohorts or through onboarding, etc. They can really be used any time that a learner has a structured learning plan in place. Now that secondary benefit is that it helps develop your managers and your leaders. The guide provides them with a structured way to ask questions of learners and provides guidance on how to coach. By going through this exercise, they're building that coaching muscle. Now, Jason and Jeff are experts that are on the call with us today. Would you mind sharing with us your experience with coaching guides? And maybe, um, Jeff, you could go first. Sure. Thank you very much, Carrie. So, yeah, coaching guides are, I can't say enough about them. They're kind of our bread and butter of our pull through. And I've been using them for years um, in my positions in, in sales training. And they really, as Carrie said, they serve a couple of purposes. Um, one of the ways we like to use uh, coaching guides, especially for programs where the manager or the coach was not present uh, for the training, maybe it's a continuous learning class or a skills class someone came in to take um, uh, for their development. We use the coaching guides as a way for the participant to go back with their managers and, and actually use the coaching guide as a review of what they were taught at the training event. And so you've already you've already set up your first pull through activity with the learner by having them review the coaching guide. And now you've really transferred a lot of the responsibility of pulling that training through to the manager because you've handed them a resource that you know, that they should be compelled to use. And if they don't, we have to better understand why they're not doing that. And I, I think it's also really important to think about how you design your coaching guides. Uh, all of our guides are designed with a skill survey. So it's kind of a, of a quick skill assessment that the manager can use with the participant to establish their current uh, level of performance around, around that, uh, that learning object. Um, of course, it's gonna have a summary of the key points and principles. And it's also gonna have a list of coaching questions that the coach can ask um, the learner or the participant in order to help you know, drive the, um, you know, the, the adoption of those skills. Mm -hmm. So they don't need to be very long, but they need to be very specific and very targeted. And they're just a great, great way to mm -hmm. pull through your training and to transfer a lot of the responsibility of the, of the training pull through onto the coach or onto the manager. Mm -hmm. Jeff, um, Jason, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, we do something similar um, <clears throat> at Bash Health with all of our programs. Uh, we recently just implemented a new program called Director Essentials uh, for new, um, new as well as tenured sales directors. And we created both a leader guide for the second line leader, as well as a participant guide or a coaching guide for the, um, uh, for the first line leader. Um, I'm sorry, a second line leader, the, the director, and a leader guy for the essentially the thir um, uh, third line uh, director. And we included in there, um, uh, similar to what Jeff mentioned, questions, a summary of the content that was, that was reviewed, as well as, um, so they had a high level or an executive level summary of the content that was reviewed. They had a scorecard similar to what Jeff was saying, but a scorecard where they could take a baseline of where they think their director is um, upon completing the program, as well as 
at different time points, three, six, nine months post-program. And we've evolved over time where now for like the, this director program, we've scheduled it where they have to have a check-in with their director at different time points to really do a deeper dive on a, having a, a having a coaching conversation around specific content you know recognizing that real behavior change takes time um as much as you know 66 days depending upon how difficult the skill is that you're trying to change um it's important that we we take more of a deeper dive when we're reviewing content from programs versus trying to cover out cover all the pro content of the program over one hour call so we now spread that out over three four five six calls and we have a participant guide for the director that they use so they're they're somewhat consistent in their format and they can take notes um and then the the coach or the third line leader can can ask co coaching questions so but it's really the, the bottom line is wherever wherever your approach is it's important that you put these guides in place um you know, for our leaders, because, you know, the leadership is complex. So we have to try to really simplify it and, and, and create kind of turnkey solutions that help to sustain and really drive and sustain that behavior change. Thank you, Jason, for sharing that with us. It's great to hear how these are being used in the real world. The next application idea is around microlearning. Now, microlearning is all the rage these days, and rightly so. Learners love the short, concise nature of these learning elements, and oftentimes they're easier or less expensive to develop. But micro isn't right for everything, but it is perfect for reinforcing training and aiding in that transfer of learning. Now, this is an example of a CMR micro minute. Micro minutes are a set of curated related micro lessons that are used in a blended learning strategy uh, where we'd have traditional e-learning modules that make up the foundation of the strategy and then our clients use micro minutes as a just-in-time resource tool that learners can access at any time that really focuses on the key points of that topic and each micro lesson focuses on one simple objective um, and now this is just an example of a CMR resource but you can obviously do your own micro learning and the great thing about microlearning is that it can be done in many ways. It can be a PDF, a quick video, an infographic, a short email reminder, et cetera. And a great way to organize and deploy these microlearning pieces is through pulse learning, which is what we're going to talk about next. So basically, pulse learning is what it sounds like, pulsing or pushing small bits of related content to your learners at a frequent rate. And one of the major tenets of good microlearning is that a micro lesson should be focused on one and only one learning or performance objective. And this rings true for pulse learning too. It's a way to give your learners shorter lessons more frequently. And pulses don't have to be and really shouldn't be too long or too wordy. Pulse learning can take many forms just like micro learning. An easy way to do this is to pull pieces that you already have from existing workshops or e-learning courses as long as they make sense standing alone. Another idea is to link to reputable videos or articles or infographics that others have created that support your overall message. And these can be emailed or texted out to learners. The strategy doesn't have to be too complicated. Pulse learning is a really neat strategy to think about using within your organization. And you can check the handouts tab, that handout that I mentioned earlier, the CMR webinar handout. For an article, there's a link to an article that has concrete examples and tips on how to implement pulse learning. And Art Khan, who I talked about earlier, said that the more learners interact with the content, the more likely they are to move that information into long-term memory. So it's important to give learners what he calls learning boosts to keep the memory top of mind. He also said that it doesn't so much matter what you do or what form it's in, just as long as you do something to boost their memory of the learning. Um, and Jason and Jeff, I believe that you, you also have experience with this type of learning strategy. Uh, would you all care to elaborate and maybe this time we start with Jason first? Sure. Yeah, so these, the, the Pulse Learning has many different applications where we've seen a lot of success with this is in uh, post product launches. You know, of course, a lot of content is being developed both pre, during the, during the product launch, as well as post. So we've used gamification as a way to kind of pulse out, um, <clears throat> pulse out uh, uh, whether it be a, a, a short quiz, whether it be some type of gamification 
around the different elements of what we're trying to measure uh, as part of the post-launch or product launch uh, strategy. Great. And Jeff, you want to share um, how you've seen it used before? Yeah, so very similar. You know, we uh, we focus a lot of the um, a lot of the pulse learning on on post post POA meetings, and we focus actually a lot on on brand and in business strategy uh, when it comes to the the pulse learning. So we really want to reinforce the brand messaging or the brand tactics or the brand resources, and we're actually using a, a text messaging based system for that now because um, they're simple. You know, it limits the amount of information we can send so it doesn't get too too lengthy or too cumbersome for for the learner and we've also used some testing and some gamification as well um, you know, we've used a uh, a program in the past um, that will you know capture just a, an answer to a simple question it will it's based on the on the user's email it's sent through email and they get one or two of those a week and we can you know we can track the progress of individuals or or regions and we can score that and, and kind of make a competition out of that so um, so we use it both ways okay great thank you job aids can also be a great way to help learners apply what they've learned and job aids can take a variety of forms they can be simple word documents loaded on your intranet that learners can access in their time of need or they can be a little bit more sophisticated like this one where learners can type in their information, and save it as a document or PDF, they can work on it later, or they can email it to their supervisor to get feedback. And really the point with job aids is just to have them, have them available for the most common tasks or jobs your learners are doing, and have them available at the point when they need it, you know, just in time. Another application tool can be podcasts. Podcasts are great because they let learners listen to material when they have windshield time. Um, and CMR, to make things a little bit easier for learners, we've curated podcasts from various industry thought leaders into topics, and we call these collections Thought Leader Insights. Thought Leader Insights can be a great way for learners to gain real-world advice from experts, and a lot of times podcasts from experts can bridge that gap between the learners uh, knowing and understanding something and really hearing how it relates and applies to the real world. Group calls or cohorts are another great way for learners to process what they've learned. Uh, they're best used to reinforce key topics learned in e-modules or application tools. And these calls could have a portion of review, but then really focus on the application. We've seen these work best when there's time for people to share how they've applied the content or what's really been working for them. Um, Jeff and Jason, I think you, you both have experience with this as well. Would you mind sharing your experiences with group calls and cohorts? Um, Jason, you want to go? Jeff, you want to go first this time? Sure, I, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I think this is, you know, the, the group calls and the cohorts are, they're incredibly important to, to learning. And in fact, we're, we're just completing our, our first round of specialty certifications uh, for our, our oncology sales teams and our endocrinology sales teams. And it just so happens those certification uh, program is run, run through CMR, but we set it up to where uh, groups had to go through that certification together. Uh, they all do a learning module per month, and that's also followed through with a, with a group call once a month to review that learning module. And I really think it's kept people on pace um, mm -hmm. in terms of their completion of the program. We've had 100% of our endocrinology team uh, already com uh, complete the program for this year, and we're on track for about 90% of our oncology field team to complete the, uh, the specialty program. And I do attribute a lot of that to the fact that they were in cohorts and um, they have, you know, they have deadlines um, and they have responsibilities for, you know, for uh, contributing or leading on these calls. And I think it's really been, really been beneficial. And, you know, the MBA programs nowadays, most of them are, are online programs and they use this strategy and yeah. it's very effective for, for keeping people on track. Great. Thank you. Jason, do you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with Jeff. Um, so we, we use these uh, cohort calls they are embedded in all of our HIPO, high potential programs. So our emerging leaders program our field sales trainer program or FST program, they're in cohorts. Um, <clears throat> there's a monthly curriculum. 
um, you know, so short course they complete, and then uh, we create um, leader guides as well as participant guides that help supplement these uh, cohort calls for all of our programs. Um, so it helps the leader kind of uh, stay focused and on track as it relates to the content um, and helps the participants as well get the most out of those short um, calls that are held each month. And it really does a great job to kind of round out um, the programs so that there's development happening throughout the year versus only happening during the live program. So it's a great way to kind of round out your kind of blended learning strategy. Perfect, thank you. And another way, I think Capstones is our, is our last um, application tool, application idea we wanna talk about, and I think it really speaks to that uh, rounding out a blended learning solution. Um, capstones are designed to be implemented at the end of a certificate or a structured learning program. Capstones consist of writing prompts based on the learning and application that the learner should have received during the learning program or certificate. So the learner would complete the capstone writing exercise and then they would submit it to their manager or leader. And the leaders are provided with the grading criteria or rubrics that they can use to grade the responses and then pro provide feedback back to the learner. And this goes back to the coaching example we talked about earlier. These coaching interactions are the gold standard for learning transfer on the job. And this capstone exercise allows learners to reflect and talk about how they apply their knowledge and it gives managers a guided way to assess and coach their team. And again, these don't have to be complicated or over-designed, just simple four or five questions that the learners need to answer about what they should have learned and specific examples about how they're gonna apply this new knowledge. So we've heard from our experts um, a little bit throughout, but just wanted to give them another question to answer. Um, Jason and Jeff, would you mind just giving, if you have any color you want to share around how you help your learners both pull through, if there's anything you want to add to what we've spoken about already? Sure. Um, no, I guess. Uh, who, whoever wants to go first. Jason, go ahead. All right, thanks. Um, something we um, have been doing for another, another organizational initiative we've been running for coaching summits um, recognizing that the event uh, or the program is just one uh, component of any type of uh, uh, learning transfer or training that happens. One of the things we did a little bit differently with these coaching summits is we created um, a uh, essentially an eight, eight week. It could be eight weeks or it could be 16 weeks. You know, it's up to the how the director wants to pull it through. Uh, but really focusing as we rolled out a coaching model during these coaching summits is having the manager or the director lead short 30 minute calls on each step of the coaching model um, over, like I said, it could be over a, a seven week period or if they want to do it every other week could be over a 14 week period, which really helps to drive that um, that behavior change. Uh, of the managers, which ultimately has an impact on the sales reps and their performance and their engagement as well. So in, historically, we've maybe only really designed it around that 21 day, um, that, that the 21 day uh, point that uh, Britt made in the beginning, which we all thought, which I thought it takes 21 days to change behavior. Uh, it's, I'm reading that it's much longer. So I think we're kind of rethinking how we think about sustainability and needs to happen over a longer period of time, but you can do so in shorter, shorter bursts. Jeff? Right, thank you. Yeah, so, and, you know, we share the same philosophy with the pull through with the, the group calls, especially following a, a big rollout like a sales um, skills program or selling skills program. But the other area that we focus a lot on is around the micro learning and the access of the micro learning. And we, uh, we leverage a, a mobile learning application. It's obviously on the iPad or tablet based. Uh, we happen to use a um, mobile learning platform from a company called Scrimmage. Uh, it's called Playbook, but there are a lot of good uh, platforms out there to leverage. And our whole philosophy is that you have to make the, uh, the learning pieces, the micro learning pieces easily accessible. 
Uh, our app does not require a sign on. Once you sign on once, you're always signed in. And of course, the the iPad's password protected. So if you can't get into the iPad, you can't into the you can't get into the app. So, but our whole philosophy is make it easy to access uh, and make it and make it available for people so so they can use it. And the same goes with the job aids. I mean, sending a job aid on email, that's that's never going to get used. But if you put a job aid and in a mobile learning platform or maybe in their their Salesforce a CRM um, a platform, it's more likely to be accessed and more likely to be leveraged. All right, great, thank you. Now we're gonna turn it over to Brittany Conrad and she's gonna discuss uh, results and measurement with us. Thanks, Carrie. We'll spend a few minutes, the last few minutes we have today talking about measurement. Whether you guys know it or not, most of you are using this pyramid to measure your training impact. More specifically, you're likely using a specific level of the pyramid from the Kirkpatrick model to measure your training impact. Let's talk about each of these levels for a brief moment. Level one being satisfaction. How do the learners react to the training? Was the training enjoyable, relevant, and useful? While at the bottom of the pyramid, satisfaction does generate engagement and helps us to know if the training was generally accepted. Level one is typically measured through simple surveys and just general feedback that we get from our learners. Level two looks at the learning itself. Have your learners actually learned what you wanted them to? Level two typically looks like um, testing, things that are embedded within the actual training materials. Level three, looking at the impact. Learning new information or a skill is fantastic, but this level is all about what the, learn, what the learning has carried over in the day-to-day -day life of the learner. Level three can be measured through the cohort discussions that we've talked about, one-on-one -on -one coaching, or just general feedback of day-to-day -day interactions. Level four starts to look at the results, what we all care about. While learning and impact, um, our ultimate outcome for some, you don't have to go too far up the ladder before someone will ask what difference did it make. The learning and the change in behavior have to be tied to some measurable impact on performance. Level four can be measured through numbers like sales results or even turnover. Level five, the very top, return on investment. Finally, the question has to be asked, was it worth it? That is, did the knowledge or skill gained make enough of a positive impact to account for the time and the money that was invested to complete the program? Level five is typically a detailed measurement of dollars spent versus dollars earned. CMR works with all of our clients to measure the success of their off-the-shelf programs and try to partner on all levels. Recently, we partnered with COA Pharmaceuticals on a level four measurement. They saw a 20% increase in sales ranking and a 10% decrease in overall turnover for those participating in the program. So no matter what you're measuring, it is important that you determine what you want to measure up front. Figuring out what you want to measure before starting your project makes it easy to determine if the end result was successful. Levels three through five require detailed planning and often a commitment for many areas of the company, so starting early is always best. You also want to look at the frequency that you will measure. You know, depending on the level, we need to measure these at multiple stages. For example, if you're looking at measuring the learning at level two, you might want to plan for multiple measurements to truly see and measure retention. So in the last few minutes, we definitely want to be able to leave time to hear from Jeff and Jason regarding measurements. So I'll turn it over to you all, and maybe each of you could comment on um, measurements. So what, how do you determine what you measure up front? What are some of the things that you guys are doing in regards to measurements? Go ahead, Jeff. So actually, yeah, you know, I think, I think any training plan has to have a measurement strategy for each part of that pyramid, all right? Um, you know, we always want to me measure our knowledge transfer um, uh, with a program, always satisfaction. And I like to think of satisfaction in terms of adult learning, right? So did the program meet the adult learning principles? You know, was it relevant? Did people find the learning or the, the program applicable to their on-the-job activities? So you certainly want to measure that. Um, and then in terms of transferring to on-the-job behaviors, a lot of our training is actually generated from 
observations that come to us from our sales management team. And they'll say things like, you know, our, our reps are having problems answering questions around the treatment landscape for pancreatic cancer. Well, that gives us a clear, a clear training measure. It gives us a clear way to build the, you know, what to build the training on, but they've given us a gap already. And we have to be able to measure if that gap was closed or not. And I think if we listen for the right clues from our, uh, you know, from our stakeholders, we'll know exactly, exactly what to measure because they've come to us with, with mm -hmm. that gap. And we should be able to put through a program that, that closes that gap. Yeah, I would just add that, you know, it starts with what we agree upon at the beginning of any type of initiative or program, whatever it may be, in terms of what is the behavior change that we're looking to achieve. Um, you know, it starts with establishing what the objectives are and ensuring that the learning and the, the is linked to that, is linked to the, those, those objectives defined, um, you know, with the, with, with the customers, with the stakeholders. Um, and then there's different ways that we we do things with our programs. We do baseline self-assessments, pre pre-program as well as post-program, and then again at different time periods. Um, you know, like with our coaching summits, when we did in the spring, we did it at the beginning, we did it a few months post spring summit, and as we prepare for the fall coaching summit, they're doing another baseline, so we can kind of get a, a sense of how they uh, how they feel about um, them applying the, the skills that we're teaching them. And then, you know, you can, you can include different types of measurement within Kurtzpatrick also within your programs uh, in terms of, uh, you know, how you, how you look to measure different things, so. Great, thank you. And I know that we are at the end of our 30-minute mini webinar. We crammed a lot into this 30-minute webinar, so thank you all for joining us. If anyone has questions, um, please, um, you can submit them or, or contact us, and we will make sure that your questions get answered. Um, and Tim, we'll, we'll turn it back over to you for any closing comments. Well, thank you very much, Carrie. Let me uh, thank everybody uh, first for attending, all of you for attending. Also, to thank our speakers, Carrie Garrett, Brittany Conrad, Jason Zeman and Jeff Taylor, and thank CMR Institute for sponsoring today's webinar. Again, their information is here on the uh, bottom of the information on the bottom of the screen. If you have an email address and phone, if you have any additional questions, CMR folks will be glad to hear from you. And you can always send questions through L10 as well, and we'll pass them on to anybody in case you did not catch this information. It will also show on the recording. Speak that recording will be sending you an email about one hour from now with a link to the archived recording. It'll also be available on the CMR Institute site soon and on the L10 site soon as well. So with, as, as everybody leaves today, just let me end with a few, uh, some information about L10 coming up for uh, those of you who are going to be in these various cities. We have a screenshot here of some of the L10 calendar events coming up. We've got some networking mixers happening next month, our annual conference next year in the Dallas area, June 3rd to 6th, 2019. And then we've got some uh, primetime trainer core classes and master class taking place December 10th to 12th in Parsippany, New Jersey, and December 13th to 14th in Parsippany. And I'm going to tell you about this Science of Learning program here on the next slide. This is a brand new half-day workshop we're doing. It's actually two half-day workshops. The morning will be devoted to the science and practice of modern learning, and the afternoon, the science and practice of testing. You can take either or both of these programs if you like, and we are offering a $200 uh, discount off the L10 annual conference for those who register for the full day of training on November 8th in Parsippany. Uh, finally, I wanted to mention to you the, the Network After Work Mixers. These are a great chance to meet some of your local L10 colleagues. So if you're going to be in Indianapolis on November 14th or Boston on November 27th, or you can be in those cities, we'd love to have you join us for these free mixers. Again, a great way to uh, meet some of your local uh, L10 colleagues, and you learn from our speakers as well at the local programs. And finally, I'm going to send you an invitation to join us again for our next L10 webinar, which will be this coming Friday. We'll have Dr. Carl Kopp talking to us about gamification topics. Uh, that program starts at 12.30 p.m. Eastern this coming Friday. You can register at l-10.org webinars. 
My email address is showing here at the bottom of the screen. If I can help you with anything around today's program or your L10 membership, certainly don't hesitate to reach out. So with that all said, I'm going to send a final goodbye, our final thank you to all of our speakers today. Uh, thank you to CMR for sponsoring, and mostly thanks to all of you for attending today's program. We look forward to seeing you soon, and enjoy the rest of your day and the rest of your week. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thanks.